welcome again to ReefQuest. We haven't seen you folks for a while, and today we're going to take a little time to go back and revisit the reef. We're going to take a look again at exactly what a coral reef is, what a temperate reef is, and today we're going to get into the reef and find out where people, where people or critters live, um, how they function within the reef. And today we do have a new group of kids with us here. As you can see, they're working hard on something that they're going to share with you in a few minutes. We also have Tim Moline over on the internet, and we're going to get uh, over to him in a few minutes and would like you guys to start thinking about questions you might want to send in to us. we would like you to send us some questions today. We're going to touch on them. And Tim, can you explain to them how through the internet they might get these to us? Sure can, Patty. Of course, go to the uh, Kids Science homepage. It's listed on your screen and also on back of me. And scroll down to ReefQuest, just below National Programs. Click on it and you will come into, of course, the ReefQuest homepage. Once you are there, simply scroll down again to ReefQuest short answer form. Click on it, and right there is where you can ask your question. Okay. Uncle Joe live underwater, but let's take a look at this unique critter of Uncle Joe's here. Hello, Patty, and everybody in ReefQuest. This is Uncle Joe back again to try to show you some unusual creatures, creatures that dominate the reef, but yet are very important. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move my video camera down again on this rocky reef off the coast of Southern California, and I'll move it in to a snail. A snail, it's a grazer. You can see it directly in front of the camera. I'll adjust the light slightly. This snail about three inches in diameter, has a common name called the wavy top turbot. Now as I move it back in, you can see it moving back inside for protection. The bony plate directly in front of the camera is called the operculum. It's like a trap door that protects this little snail. Now if I move my finger in, you can see how it retracts its muscular foot to seek the protection inside its coiled shells. Now, what is this snail doing? Well, like many of them that you see next to our merchants, it actually grazes on this small algae that grows on top of the rocks. So these animals then have a little tiny serrated tongue called a radula, and it goes over the reef, kind of scraping back and forth the bits of algae. These wavy type turbines really like this reef. They have a very, very thick, hard shell, and the shell is usually encrusted with some kind of marine animal. And if you look closely on this one, you see a white covering. This is a bryozoan, it's a moss animal that lives on top of the shells. But other ones, other ones have different types of algae and encrusting organisms that kind of act like a hitchhiker. So as the snail goes on in search for a better pasture, better grazing area, he carries the hitchhikers along with him. So from Southern California, let me move once again my video camera downward and let's take a look at our friend the wavy top turbine snail as he slowly, slowly moves over the reef, eating the algae that is growing on top of the rocks. You know, there's a lot of critters that live in the reef environment. Right. And it seems like there's got to be something really special in that whole environment, that ecosystem, that makes it work. You know, I'm sure there's times when things get off balance and it doesn't work, but you know, what is it about it that makes it successful? Well, one of the things that sort of holds the reef all together is the food web. There's all these interactions of eating and being eaten, and that's one of the things that helps keep a balance on a reef, is the creatures that produce food, the creatures that gather food, and the creatures that do the cleanup at the end. We've got some creatures in our reef right here. Let me just go around and introduce so them. So everybody in the reef has a role, don't they? They all have a role, something that they do that helps the stability and the balance on the reef. Okay, first one would be what? Is it the top, is it the bottom or the top we're talking well, about? Well, you really, when you want chain. to think about where energy comes from, you have to think about the sun when it comes to coral reefs. Okay. There's one group of creatures that can take sunlight and raw materials and turn that into food. And those are the producers, so things like seaweeds, 
and actually coral. So let's see if we have any seaweeds here. Let's have all the seaweeds uh, raise their hands. Or stand up. Stand up. That, uh, that way we can okay. see. We've got some limu, some seaweed here. Okay, thank you. Now we also have corals here. Now corals are animals, remember, but they have plants living inside. Let's have the corals stand up. So these are the reefs producers. They're going to use sun energy and raw materials, and they're going to make food that other creatures are going to be okay, able so to use. Okay, so corals going to be both a producer and a consumer. consumer. Okay. Animals cannot make their own uh, energy from sunlight. They get their energy by eating something else. So corals can also do that because they're animals. Okay, let's have the producers uh, sit back down. The consumers are the eaters of plant matter that actually eat right off the seaweeds are called herbivores. So I've got a couple of herbivores here. Let's see, we've got a green sea turtle. Let's have the green sea turtle stand up. And we've got a damselfish over here. And we have a manini. And they're all going to depend on the seaweed for food. They're called herbivores. Or vegetarians. Or vegetarians. Okay. Now, there are animals that eat other animals, and we call them carnivores, meat eaters. Okay. okay. And we do have some meat eaters today. Herbivores, why don't you sit? And we'll bring up our carnivores. And let's see, we've got an eel, mori eel here. And we've got a top carnivore over here, a shark. These are the scary guys. Well, they have a still a very important role on the reef. OK, thanks, carnivores. Now, there's still a cleanup crew to go. If an animal dies and its body falls on the bottom, we need to clean that up, keep the reef balanced. We've got things like our crab here that's a scavenger, can pick apart the dead bodies and help clean up the reef. <laughs> and all those little bits. Uh, of material that dissolve in the water can be captured by a feather duster worm, which is a filter feeder, and can be picked out of the sand by a sediment feeder like a sea cucumber. So this is the balance on our reef. The producers, the herbivores, the carnivores, and the whole cleanup crew. Okay, let's take a look at how all these guys function together. Okay. You're going to do this with a certain activity. Explain what we're doing here. All right, we've got a parachute in here, and right in the middle of the parachute is a bucket with a, a ball in it. And the parachute represents the balance of the food web. And we're going to see if we're balanced or not by watching the bucket with the ball in the middle. If the bucket and the ball tip over, then we'll know that the balance of the food web on the reef is starting to fall apart. So what all the students are going to do for us today is they're going to slow, they're going to pull back on their edge of the food web and slowly stand. And, and they're going to hold it and balance right there in front of them. OK, perfect. And the ball in the middle is means that it's balanced. It's now, balanced. How might it get off balance? Well, you know, one of the ways something can get off balance is by an interaction with something from outside. So for example, say there was an oil spill, and the oil flowed over the reef through the water and coated all of the seaweeds and the corals so that they couldn't get sunlight and they couldn't produce food anymore. So what happens if we knock out all the producers in the reef food web. So if you're a producer, a seaweed, or a coral, you're going to let go of your part of the web right now, and we'll see if we can keep balance. OK? Well, it's starting to bit off a little bit. Okay. Now, we don't have any producers, so what are the herbivores going to feed on? So if you're a herbivore, you don't have anything to eat. Now you're going to let go and drop out. Uh-oh, the balance is starting to go. If all of the herbivores are gone, what are the carnivores going to feed on? If you're a carnivore, your food is gone. Carnivores, you can drop out now. Oh, and for a while, the balance might stay because all of these members of the cleanup crew are going to be able to feed on the bodies of all other creatures that have died. But eventually, they'll run out of food, too, and there'll be nothing to restore the reef. So let's have the cleanup crew let go. Oh, well. The reef has uh, suffered an ecological disaster. We haven't been able to get the balance back. Let's, let's take a look at a real reef situation right. and a, what, an animal that we call a predator, a hammerhead shark. And we've got uh, something for you to watch here on the hammerhead shark right. and the role that the hammerhead shark plays in the reef and how scientists are looking at trying to figure out just what effect this hammerhead does have on the reef here in Hawaii. We know that sharks are top-level predators in the ocean, but we don't know exactly how important they are. Part of the problem is these animals are tough to study. They can get really large, they can travel great distances, and they're not as hardy as most people think. They're actually quite fragile. Sharks like the scalloped hammerhead are known as obligate swimmers, meaning from the time they're born to the time they die, they never stop swimming. They have to swim through the water with their mouths open to get enough of that oxygenated water across her gills in order to breathe. 
So if they quit swimming for more than 10 minutes, they'll literally suffocate. And trying to study these animals in captivity, that means you can never restrain the animals for very long. You have to provide them with holding tanks and areas that they can continuously swim and give them enough space that they can do that comfortably. Kaniwe Bay, being the largest bay in the Hawaiian Islands, provides an excellent nursery and pupping ground for these sharks. We have a lot of reefs in Kaniwe Bay, but also we have a lot of deep water where it's very muddy on the bottom. And that's the habitat that these sharks spend most of their time in, in the deep, murky portions of the bay. However, at night and during certain parts of the day, they'll cruise along the edges of the reefs, and it's out there where they're probably getting a lot of their food. Hammerhead shark pups are probably the most abundant, and in terms of their sheer number and weight, the most predominant top-level predator in Kaniwe Bay. The question that I wanted to answer is how much energy do these sharks take from Kaniwe Bay? That's one way that you can look at the impact that an animal has on its ecosystem. So to do that, I needed to develop a system that I could measure how much energy the typical shark was using on a day-to-day -day basis. So to do that, what I've done is built a, a big treadmill for sharks. And this is a water treadmill that I could put the sharks in and make them swim against a current, swim in place, much like a person walking on a treadmill. And then by knowing how much oxygen the shark was consuming while it's swimming at a certain speed, I could determine how many calories it's burning. Now, every organism, including us, uses oxygen to break down our food that we eat and convert that into energy that we can use to walk and play and do all the things that we do. Well, these hammerheads use oxygen in the same way. So by knowing how much oxygen they consume, I can predict how many calories they're burning. The next piece of the puzzle I had to solve was developing a tool that would enable me to get from the swim tunnel, what I'd learned from in the laboratory, and apply that to free swimming sharks in the field. So I needed to build something that would enable me to count the shark's tail beats while they're swimming in the field. And I had to build something that wouldn't hurt them or affect their behavior, but would enable me to follow them around and measure and count their tail beats. So I spent a lot of time in the laboratory building an electronic device that I could attach to the sharks, and the device had to be just the right size and shape so that it wouldn't affect their behavior or swimming. My typical tracking day consists of getting all the boat ready with all the tracking equipment, going out into the shark grounds, the areas where these pups live, and then using hook and line, I can drop a piece of squid down to the bottom of the bay floor, and within 10 to 15 minutes, I catch a hammerhead pup. So I can bring it up to the surface, and the first thing we do is invert the shark. And by inverting it so that its belly's up, these sharks go to sleep into something known as tonic immobility. So once the sharks are inverted, we can take the hook out, we can measure them and weigh them. And then we can attach the transmitter to the shark's tail. Once the transmitter is attached to the shark and I send it on its way, the next big trick is staying with the animal and not losing it. Now these transmitters that I use produce a ring or a, a sound that is much, much higher than the sharks can hear. So I know the transmitters aren't producing a sound like a loud ticking clock that would drive the sharks crazy. It's a sound that they can't even hear, but using my hydrophone, I can then hear the sharks and easily follow them around the bay. So now that information gets put into a receiver, and that receiver basically counts the time interval between each pulse and then outputs that to a laptop computer. So I can count every single tail beat that a shark makes during the course of a 48-hour period. And that could be several million tail beats over the course of two days. And now you just use this as a backup, just in case. If you don't want to spend 48 hours out here and find out your hard drive crashed or something bad. <laughs> so once I know how many calories the average hammerhead shark burns per day, I can then look at how many calories the whole population of sharks in Kaniwe Bay consumes on a daily basis. Now it's been estimated from tagging studies that anywhere between five to 8,000 hammerhead pups are born in Kaniwe Bay every summer. Now that's a lot of hungry little mouths out there. And if they're burning so many calories per day, how much food do those sharks have to eat on a day-to-day -day basis to meet their energetic demand? They have to eat a certain amount of calories per day. So how many reef fish does that make up? How many shrimp does that make up? These are typical prey that these sharks feed on. So what impact, how many shrimp, how many gobies are these sharks taking out of the bay on a year-to-year -year basis? And this is how we can get at the impact that the shark population has on a marine ecosystem like Kaniwe Bay.
everybody's got something. Now, the kids, we've asked them to create some critters that they have special adaptations that they think might like to live in the reef. Tisha, tell me about yours. What is there about this critter? Um, it can camouflage with its surroundings and the, these things up here, it can squirt water into, into the other fish and make it blind so it can run away. <laughs> cool. Okay, camouflage. Now, why would you need to camouflage yourself, Carol? Well, there are predators out there. Uh, there's also some interesting teeth here. Can you tell us just a tiny bit about the teeth? Um, it can um, go into the fish and make it paralyzed for a little while. Wow. Ooh. Mean fish. <laughs> yeah, you have a crab, crab claw here. It's a right. big one. Well, the reason I wanted to know about the teeth on that animal is because I've got a very special crab claw from something called a 7-Eleven crab. It's a great big pebble crab. It's got a great big heavy knob on the claw, and that's used for cracking open snail shells. And this is a shell from a cowrie that's been absolutely popped in half, and then the crab would pull the meat out, and that's where it would get its energy. So that's an example of a carnivore's adaptation for feeding. That's going to go after this one that's really trying to hide itself. Okay, let's take a look at another one. This one is a really interesting one. Michi, tell, me, tell us about this creature. Um, this, is, this is a creature that has a vacuum cleaner nose so that it can pick up... <laughs> Cute. It can pick up little um, bits of food from the coral, and it also has a tail with spikes on it, just in case um, a predator is chasing it, it can swing it around to protect itself. Oh. Wow. Amber has created a very unique um, fish here, or creature. Amber, tell us a little bit about this. Well, this creature is like an eel-like creature with the protection that is these little spines. And there's this false eye spot right there that protects itself. So when a fish comes behind it, it could just sting them. Oh, cool. And, wow. and what's, what's this on the other end, this green thing? Oh, this? Yeah. Well, that's little fish, and this is squirting out some poison to kill, um, kill them. And so this... A lot of wow. protection and quite a structure to this fish's body then. Yeah, so yeah, something like this animal would have to have a skeleton inside, I th I'd think. And these are some pieces of backbone from different kinds of fish. This is two sections or two vertebrae from the backbone of a um, spear fish, a fast moving fish of the open water. And this is a single vertebrae or backbone segment from a shark. Hey, you know, speaking of sharks and out in the water, we now have Uncle Joe live underwater, and I don't know if he's got a shark with us with him, but Uncle Joe, are you there? And what have you been able to find today? Well, hello, Patty, Carol, and everybody in the Reef West audience. This is live, Uncle Joe, and I'm at Taniyoe Bay. I am on a reef, and let me point you down to a coral reef. You can see. Some of the small damsel fish in front of the camera. We have some rife coral, which is the most dominant coral that we have down here. This habitat is very, very good for protection on many species. And in front of the camera now, you may be able to see an animal that we discussed before. This is a little worm. Little Polychaete worm, and notice then that when I move my camera in front of this little worm, uh, hopefully it will be able to almost instantly retract. So let me push my camera downward, and of course the worm <laughs> back inside. Now, diving in Kanyoe Bay, one of the things that was mentioned is there are many, many thousand hammerhead sharks around here. And what I thought I saw a little while ago was a little hammerhead whoop, actually swimming around. <laughs> now, what the heck do we have here, kids? This is uh, my little friendly hammerhead that comes in to say hello to us. You'll notice the unusual adaptation, which is the eyes. These eyes are very special. Not only are they set out on the head, but they have sensors that magnify the light like tiny mirrors, giving them twice the low light level capability as even cats. And we know cats can see very well underwater. So as my little hand shark then moves around the reef, you can see its extended eyes out really allows it to survey its territory, including coming down. Hey, Joe? 
Uncle Joe, are you there? Oh, your hammerhead just scared a feather duster worm there. Um, Uncle Joe, we have a question from Noe Lani, a school here in Hawaii. And Noe Lani, who is there? Hi. And what's your question for Uncle Joe? How many hammerhead shark, hammer sharks are in there? Uncle Joe, the question was, how many hammerhead sharks are you seeing down in there? Oh, well, actually, today, Patty, we didn't see any hammerhead sharks. We did see about 50 more titles about 20 damselfish, and we had a lot of mullet baitfish in the water. But in this particular area, we're relatively shallow, and we have not seen any hammerheads, except my little friend that I brought with me to say hi. <laughs> oh, no, I thought he was real, Joe. I was worried about you. Um, let's, let's go to, I think we have a question all the way from Michigan also. And Michigan, are you there? Hello? And who is this? Um, this is Mark. Okay, Mark. Hi, my name is Mark J. What's I am in the fourth grade. I'm nine years old. And my question is, how did Uncle Joe design and build the coral cam? Whoa. <laughs> well, hello, Mark. Uh, I'm glad that you had a chance to see the coral cam. The coral cam then has a miniature camera and a small, tiny computer built inside it. I hope you have an opportunity to tune in and look at the pictures. We're going to uh, actually move it to a different location, so stay tuned, and maybe I'm going to hire you to help me build the next coral cam, Mark. Got another question from here in the studio. While, while, keep looking at that stuff, Joe, and Michi, what's your question for him? Um, Uncle Joe, in the habitat where you're near, um, what kind of animals would live there? The animals that live inside this coral habitat are feather duster worms, which we have seen, small shrimp, tiny fish. Occasionally we can see a little moray eel tucked in the side. Many of these animals then are animals that need the protection of the reef because they do have other predators. Now, I know that Randy has found some interesting animals, so what I'm going to do is bring the camera up in front of Randy and give you an idea then of maybe some of the, some of the animals then that we see on the reef. Now, Randy will put them down. The first one that we're going to look at is actually a type of coral known as a mushroom coral. Well, most corals then are what's called sedentary, in other words, they're attached. This coral then actually can move around. I'll bring it close to the camera. And at night, it has tiny appendages which go out and allow it to move around. Now, another animal that we see on the reef is a feather duster worm. And we saw it retract before. Here you can see it held in my hand. Its little parchment tube then is perfectly designed to fit inside the coral for protection. So that's an excellent adaptation. I know many of you have talked about sea cucumbers, and this is what I have in my hand. The sea cucumbers then actually live on the bottom in this sediment or sandy area, and they feed on the organic nutrients on the inside. Now, in this area, we do have a number of different sea cucumbers, and somebody had talked about the tentacles moving around in the mouth. So in front of my camera, you can actually see the tentacles from this sea cucumber extending outward as it moves down to search for food on the reef. We have another question here, Joe, from in the studio. And what's your question? How deep of water are you in, Uncle Joe? Well, the water that we're diving into right now off Coconut Island in Kaneohe Bay is about, oh, about 20 feet deep. The water temperature is about 80 degrees. But you know, we had a big storm coming through here, some of the largest waves in Hawaii. So the visibility really isn't quite that good today. Uncle Joe, we got another question that's come in on the internet. And Tim, can you give us the question, please? Hello, Joe. Yes, Paris from Wayne is asking, how can you dive in the reef without getting bit? Uh, I didn't quite catch that. Can you repeat that, please? Yes, Paris and Wayne is asking you, how can you dive in the reef without getting bit? Without getting bit? Right. 
Uh, there's not too much down here to bite us, so we don't have any hammerhead sharks. And the only thing that we could possibly run into would be something that Randy has brought me, this little sea urchin. Of course, you can see the spines on it. We certainly wouldn't want to impact that. This is one common animal on the reef. And we also have a tiny sea cucumber. I've shown you two other species. This little white sea cucumber. Uncle Joe, we need to leave you at this time. And um, thank you for uh, sharing that underwater world with us. You are loud and clear today. Bye, guys. We'll see you next week. And we just.